And welcome back to Nightwatch. I'm your host, as always, Todd Sheets, here with no Hugh or no Chris at the moment. Uh, Hugh is uh, off uh, dancing in Scotland somewhere with his kilt. Sausages. And Chris has been abducted again. (laughs) Why am I here? Yes, Chris has been abducted, but I'm still here, ready to uh, have a wonderful time with all of you, all of my friends out there. It's a wonderful day and uh, evening, and it's going to be, depending on what part of the world you're in, I guess. It's day or evening. But for me, of course, it's the it's the darkness. I'm enjoying myself here in the studio. So we're going to get started. Our, our next guest is, is pretty special. It's pretty exciting because uh, she hasn't done an interview in a long, long time. And uh, we were granted this exclusive interview and it, this, this privilege, really, to talk to her. Uh, Zena Shrek is an artist, musician, author, and animal rights activist in the mystical tradition. She's a leader of the Setian Liberation Movement and provides spiritual instruction to students of all denominations. Before converting to Tantric Buddhism in the Karma Kaju League, uh, Zena was one of the most iconic figures in the modern history of black magic. Two of her short fiction stories are in this month's religion issue of the literary journal Beatdom, and her website is Zena.eu. Everybody, welcome to the show. Zena Shrek. Thanks very much. That's very kind of you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. And and I know that there's a pretty interesting story on how we got you here in the first place. I know uh, our producer, Amanda, who's going to chime in here, was out scouring the Internet because of what reason, Amanda? What were you doing? Well, <laughs> this is funny, and I'm going to – people are going to make fun of me. But I make skins for people who are live in virtual worlds. Now, hold on. Skins? What yeah. are you, like Leatherface? You're, yeah, <laughs> you're I'm sewing like together. Leatherface. together. <laughs> no, it's like uh, people have these little avatars in these little worlds, and I just make them look really real. They put them on, and they look like real people running around in there. So these are basically like little uh, the, the patterns that you put on. Yeah, they're like little yeah. human skin patterns that I make up in Photoshop, and people buy them from me. Okay. And um, there's one place I went, and people were buying them there, and there was a problem, and I was like looking at their profile, and they were talking about how they role play a vampire thing. Um, it's White Wolf. Um, what what uh, what is it? Um, vampire the Masquerade. Yeah, is there is a Vampire the Masquerade, and they have like 500 followers in in their group of these people who who worship Set. It's what it is is like an Egyptian mm-hmm. vampire um, group. And and so I was like, I wonder if that's really real, because I was talking, and they're like, Oh yeah, we're all over the it's world. It's Conan too. Remember the original yes, Conan? Yes, yes. I and that's what another thing is. I remember watching Conan and the snakes and things, and I was like, Hey, maybe there's something to it. And they're like, Yeah, it's real. We're real. And I'm like, Oh. And so I went and I. Of course, started- I've been chased around by people that are part of <laughs> Vampire the Masquerade, trying to anoint my blood or their sword with my blood. So I don't know. See, that's just that was kind of odd. Yeah. So. I started Googling, and I ran into Xena. Wow. Yeah. And it turned out it really is real. Yeah. Well, not like that, though. Well, it's not like, yeah. She'll clear that part out Good, good. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to be chased around. Yeah. Because, like, I was talking to the girl um, who who I, who I did the skin thing with me, bought the skin, and she's like, yeah, my real life is really hard because the Malkavians are chasing me around in real life now. And I'm like, oh, well, I have to go. Yeah, you, yeah, that's kind of something. <laughs> well, Zena, why don't you tell us a little bit about us, the Setian Liberation Movement? Okay, well, I'm sorry to say it's certainly not a role-playing game. And <laughs> um, but that's very interesting because I think it was one of my students who, if that's if that's the same group that calls themselves the followers of Set, I think that was brought to my attention a couple of years ago. So, <laughs> yeah, I think there's a um, Sufi proverb that goes something to the effect of um, there wouldn't be such a thing as counterfeit gold if there were no such thing as real gold. So, exactly, yeah. In other words... Um, there wouldn't be the motivation to create a mass market consumer replica of something that was uh, difficult to attain or even maybe fully comprehend um, to the mainstream. But obviously there's a demand and a desire for these kinds of things, but um, the motivation and maybe the understanding for what it really is is somewhat different. (laughs) 
um, from what we're doing. Obviously, what we're doing is uh, in, in the true religious and mystical tradition. So, um, first of all, I guess I should explain the Setim Liberation Movement and what its meaning is. Um, it's called Setim Liberation Movement. Um, the words themselves form an acronym that means SLM. It means Salam. And this is the ancient Egyptian Afro-Semitic word for peace. It's also the um, 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 Hebraic and Arabic origins of those languages, words for shalom and salam. So in the Setian Liberation Movement, we have um, various practices that we undergo, and these are initiatory practices that we do on a daily basis, and therefore specific goals of liberation. So that's why the word liberation is incorporated in our name. But it's also not a group to be joined in an organizational sense. So um, unlike a role-playing game or a, uh, a membership organization that you apply for and you pay a fee and you get a card and you have an identity and you have something to show your friends and you've got something, you know, with a, a sticker and a label or something. It's not like that. This is about action. It's about practice. It's about um, transcendence of certain um, conditioning and behaviors and things that are meant to change your consciousness so that uh, this is, gets back to what the liberation is all about. So when we say Setian liberation movement, Set is the god that obviously is our patron and that we are um, applying ourselves to, to as a vehicle for our liberation. Um, liberation, we have to clarify, is not in the sense of liberation from worldly things. It's not liberation from your credit card debts. It's not liberation from your mother nagging you to do the dishes, even if you're 30 years old and still in university and still living at home. Um, it's not liberation even from legitimate social repression or political tyranny. It's not re uh, liberation from a bad relationship. Um, it's not liberation in any way from worldly affairs that you understand in that sense. What we mean by liberation is the attainment of, of liberation from all attachment in a mental, uh, if, of mental comprehension of, uh, in terms of conditioning, addictions, cravings, fears, pains, worries, all of these things. So we have to understand that we're talking about liberation in the spiritual sense of meaning. Mm, um, gotcha. I don't think I don't think people who are participating in a role playing game I don't think that's their aim. So <laughs> I think that on the contrary, they are um, participating in more um, acquirement of attachments. So that's why it's, I think the polar opposite of what we're talking about now. Also, there's a phrase called um, uh, uh, spiritual uh, materialism, which um, a well-known uh, Tibetan Buddhist um, sage, Chagyam Trungpa, coined, and it means really attachment to these kinds of things. Um, they're using gods as a means of um, sort of making toys, an attachment to all these kinds of, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, using these mystical things as turning it into a kind of materialism in and of itself. And that's fine, but we have to be clear about what the difference is. So actually, one might think that I would think, oh, that's an interesting and, and uh, you know, fascinating thing that they're uh, doing this with Set, which is my god as well, but actually, 
it's just no different from any other kind of uh, uh, popular entertainment. It just so happens to be with the God that that I revere. So, so what? You know, <laughs> I mean, it doesn't mean anything one way or the other to me. But um, I just have to make it clear that that in no way could be perceived as the same thing as a religious phenomenon, which is what we are doing. So I don't know if that makes that any clearer about what we're doing in terms of spiritual liberation. Right, right. Well, I think a lot of it, uh, as far as the, these role-playing games, probably comes from uh, the use in fantasy fiction, like Robert E. Howard and, and the Conan, you know, we mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. I think Conan yeah. was, a, you know, in that regard, they were the, it was a different deal. I mean, I know everyone's seen the movie uh, where James Earl Jones turns into a giant snake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can shape shift, too, when we develop our CDs well enough, but again, developing the CDs isn't the goal of what we're doing, but it is an a indicator that we're getting somewhere on now, our path to liberation. Now, when you say <laughs> shapeshift, what does that exactly mean? Well, shapeshifting, that's um, something that, again, as I said, we can develop that. Um, it's the ability to, again, this requires the ability to transcend your attachments and your, in particular, your ego attachments to identity, to who you are, if you can get over your attachment to your labeling of yourself and your identity, um, your cherishing your identity, I should say, uh, you can be virtually anybody. And you can slip in and out of different shells and different even different animal forms or deity forms. And in fact, in tantric practice, um, that is part of what you have to do, is you have to slip into the deity form, and you must envision yourself and become the deity. So you can no longer be the human anymore. You have to become the deity, but that means revering yourself as the deity and no longer being you, the human being, or the ego attachment to you, the small, limited uh, being that you know yourself to be, but actually taking on the embodiment of the more omniscient and all-knowing deity. Is this a spiritual thing you're talking about? Yes, definitely. Do you alter your physical being, or is it oh, just... Well, that does happen. That oh, does wow. happen, yes. Wow. Well, this, is, this gets into the secret teachings, actually. Because in the secret teachings, then there are things that can transform, yes. So there was a little bit of truth in what Robert E. Howard was writing there. Well, yes, except for I don't think he was speaking from experience. <laughs> right, right. Yes. It's like he, he, he knew I mean, a little I, bit about I it. Tell you, I, I can tell you from my own experience, and this is uh, stone cold sober, by the way, not on any kind of um, chemical enhancements or anything, that... There are experiences that you can have through meditative practices at, with another person that you are taking on deity forms and you are transforming, yes. Wow, that's, that's, that's pretty that's crazy. Through, that's through meditative practices where you, through, and this takes years of training and years of mental, you know, mental, um, work in, in terms of very precise, specific meditative practices, and through the, through the training of a master or a guru who knows what they're doing to guide you, that, but that, again, I have to say, just for the entertainment of seeing transformation is not the goal or the point. Right. It is only that, it is only that that may happen that that is an indicator that you are achieving some degree, some maybe glimpse window into that you are getting somewhere on your path to liberation and ultimate enlightenment. Uh, You know, it's it's part of the journey, but it's not the the main reason you're doing it. Well, there, there are various steps along the way that are signs and indicators that you're getting somewhere, yeah. And again, that you can't be seduced you can't be seduced by the 
uh, shall we say, side effects. Because once you become become uh, once you become seduced by the side effects, and you think, oh, this is interesting, and you take a detour, and you think, oh, I'll just go here because this is in- more interesting. Then you get trapped into the ego clinging again, hmm. and that brings you back. Okay. Uh, that, that takes you further away from being released. That makes yeah. sense, yeah. If, if I was going to say if that makes sense. It does, it does. And, and, it, and it does kind of make me see where he was coming from also, because it seems like, at, like you said, he was a casual observer who knew enough, like he had read enough about it to at least kind of understand the basics, but he wasn't a practitioner. So he kind of took that and applied it to characters within his right. universe. Right, because I do think he did a lot of reading. Now, here is the difference. A lot of people do a lot of reading, and you can understand a great deal by reading a lot of books on the subject, but there is nothing to compare to having, to first of all, practicing, a daily practice. And the reason why it has to be daily practice is because the changes which occur in the mind are cumulative. They don't, you can't do it once a week. You can't do it once a month. You can't do it once every six months because it's something that has to build continuously. It's cumulative. Furthermore, you you have to be guided by somebody who knows what they're doing, who can tell you if you're headed in the wrong direction or if you're going off into fantasy land because if you're going off into fantasy land, then that could become really detrimental and you could actually, you know, wind up in the loony bin. (laughs) And a lot of people have because they believe that they're actually getting somewhere and in fact, they're just uh, get, going off on the road of delusion. And that's obviously what a lot of people, um, you know, in occultism and, and a lot of esoteric groups, they believe that they're getting somewhere, but they're not actually freeing themselves, but digging themselves into deeper quagmires mm-hmm. of more thought, actually. Wow. Yeah. And and you know the thing is also I think when you're when you're approaching something with this much spiritual uh history of being part of the universe mm-hmm. if you're not with someone who understands it completely it would be very easy to get lost in it. And I think uh, in, in a lot of ways people go down paths like this and they there's been many many texts about people who've followed a deity or followed a religion and it drove them mad because they Absolutely. couldn't really understand it. Absolutely, and it's very easy to do because there have been a lot of people, especially creative people, um, a lot of creative people have a gift for mysticism. It's not unusual. It's very common. It's a really tragic and sad thing because they have a gift for mysticism, and if they could only find somebody that they could trust to guide them gently into how to understand their mysticism and be freed by that great talent. It would be a wonderful thing because the people have this horrible misconception that in order to be a mystic, it's somehow parcel to being insane, like that you should be a, 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 a lunatic to be a mystic. But that's a really bad road to go down. A lot of people think, too, to be creative, that you have to be somehow, um, you know, that that you can't be a creative person without being somehow addicted to something, which fuels your creativity. You know, the, the image of the glamorous, drunken writer, or, you know, the drug-addicted musician. These are things that are absolutely not necessary you can be a creative person and you can be a mystic and still be sober and still have mystical experiences all from the manipulation of your mind through meditative practices which stimulate and do the exact same thing that that you know uh, people were trying to experiment with in the 60s through uh, drugs, which enhance that kind of experience only temporarily, like right. with LSD or psilocybin or things like this. Those are only temporary fixes 
that give you a gateway to understanding mystical experiences, but they cannot be permanent. They don't last. Well, and I know a lot of people did, used uh, the psilocybin tea, right? And they uh, they would, uh, and not just in in one religion, but many different religions kind of crossed over into that usage. I thought I found out it was kind of interesting to read about, and a lot of people, like in the occult, were using that, and and it was kind of dangerous because if you're if you're kind of on a path that's not for self righteousness or self fulfillment, you're going to kind of go into a place that's pretty dark. Absolutely, absolutely, and the the, the problem is. If you're already um, if you're already going in that direction, it may be, maybe you're already a little mentally imbalanced in the first place, and you don't need much of a tip in that direction to go off the deep end. So you don't you should you ought not to tamper with something if you're not you know <laughs> if you're not balanced in the first place. You don't need that. In other words, you don't need to go that route. So that's why people really need to be very careful about what they're doing. In, in the end, a lot of people in the West, simply because they have been totally strict and castrated, mentally I mean, of the notion of the awareness of the understanding of the whole spirit world anymore. I mean, frankly, since the Age of Enlightenment, we in the West just do not understand the whole rich mystical universe that is that exists, we have thrown that all away. We threw the baby out with the bathwater when we threw away religion, and when we left that to supposedly the fanatics, the religious fanatics. But there's got to be a middle ground now for people in the developed world. There's got to be some kind of a compromise to understanding that, yes, the whole mystical experience is a reality. You don't have to be frightened of it. You don't have to think that people will think you're crazy for experiencing it. You just have to experience it in a responsible way, taught by responsible people, not by, you know, irresponsible drug addicts that are going to, you know, lead you in a completely wrong direction. You have to go in a safe direction. And a safe direction doesn't necessarily mean an ascetic direction, but it means a direction that is going to show you the right way, not a, a damaging and disastrous way. You see, because in other parts of the world where a magical religious lifestyle is still happening all the time, you don't have to explain these things to them. I mean, when I go to Nepal or India, it's a reality. You don't have to, you don't have to explain karma and cause and effect and uncontrollable recurring rebirths. You don't have to explain that if you do something that in, it may not uh, be effective what you do, of your actions may not uh, ripen tomorrow, but the effect of it may ripen in your next lifetime. Because they're thinking about that. Some right. Of them anyway. right, right, but, but in But in America, they're not thinking about that. They're just thinking about, what can I get today? What can, uh, you know, how can I um, look out for number one right now, today? And they're not thinking about what's going to happen tomorrow. No, because they all, all sense of, of, all sense of spiritual... Awareness has been stripped yeah. from from the industrial from the industrialized world. Well, and and also I think uh, you know the aftermath of the Crusades. Uh, we, we're kind of living that now because a lot of things were uh, you know thrown away, cast aside, uh, hidden. Um, they were yeah. told they could not be a part of these things, and so over generations. It seems like when they were forbidden to be a part of anything other than this one main religion, then the other religions kind of went back underground or were, were put back into secret societies. And especially in the Western world, you know, here in America, we were taught, okay, anything other than this is evil. It, it's pagan. It's dark. It's, it's wrong. 
uh, I grew up, my mom was a Baptist school teacher, and even going through that, we were taught Buddhism was wrong, and it was a pagan thing, and it was a... It was oh, absolutely. That's because America is a completely dualistic society. It is a good versus evil uh, society. And in a dualistic society, you can only, you know, it's, it's a very constricting way of thought. So, of course, uh, uh, the idea of Buddhism would be just as evil as, um, as Satanism, for that matter. Uh, it, it, was, it would just be anything that isn't in this paradigm of good versus evil would be uh, considered beyond the pale. So that's completely understandable, yeah. Frustrating, though, for people who want to have an open mind and explore life, it's pretty frustrating to be told everything you think about. Ah, oh, you better not go down that road. You're going to go to hell. I always wanted to live a little more open, you know. Yeah, but actually, uh, that that that's that is even. <laughs> I mean, even that interpretation of. I mean, I have to say because I'm I'm all for uh, interfaith dialogues, and I work with other. I mean, I actually work with all denominations, but even that interpretation of Christ's teachings is a denigration of the original teachings of Christ, because that would not be recognizable to the original teachings of... I mean, his original disciples would not have that attitude either, because Christ was a mystic. Right. So, I mean... Jesus Christ was a rebel and a magician and a mystic himself. So when people have that kind of an attitude themselves, this is completely contrary to the understanding of Christ's teachings as they were originally understood. So even, and, and, and frankly, um, as a Setian as practitioner, Set, is misunderstood in the world of cultism because Set is more, uh, Set being frequently misperceived as just another uh, form or manifestation of Satan, this is completely misunderstood. Set has more to do with Jehovah, Jesus Christ, and Allah, historically and biblically and archaeologically. He is more linked in, in all of the uh, Hellenic prayers and magical papyri with Jesus and, and what we know today as God. So this is why when you tell me things like this about how you know, you're upbringing in the Baptist community and things like this, I think to myself, of everything that I know about Set now today that I didn't even know at, at the beginning of my journey as a Setian, this also uh, bothers me as well, because Baptists don't realize, too, that Set is really the father of all of these three Abrahamic religions. <laughs> but that is a secret, which I will eventually write about, that Set is the father of all of those religions. He is like the Ur father of those religions, which oversees the Arch He's the Archon of this Aeon. Hmm. Yep. You heard it here first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And no, now, but that's actually archaeologically too. Wow. And and historically too. Uh, for example, um, there are many prayers to Set where his name is Eo, and Eo is another name that set, that's Typhon Set or Abraxas. Those are the names. Eo is the name interchangeably used for Typhon Set and Abraxas. And Abraxas, Eo is also known as the name for the father of Jesus. And Abraxas, the first four letters of Abraxas, are the same first four letters of Abraham. And, the, and that's interchangeable with also a word which we know, which was used in the ancient Gnostic uh, magical spells, which we now know popularly, as <laughs> comically even to this day, as abracadabra, hmm. because it's the first same first four letters of Abraham, Abraxas, and abracadabra, but it all goes back to Seth. 
and and it's all connected to Jehovah, Allah, and Jesus. Hmm. There's a link between all of them. Wow. Much more than Satan. And the only reason, probably, or one of the only reasons why there may tangentially be a connection is because in some of the Gnostic understandings of Set, he was a demiurge. He was considered a demiurge. Hmm. And in some of, in some of the uh, practices, he was thought that way, that, he, that though he was the archon of this aeon, that, that they considered that a, a negative thing. Hmm. That this was that this was a world which needed to be transcended to get away from, actually, because it's a world. But look at this. This is a world of chaos. This is a world of storms and chaos. And what other god would be? If you know anything about Set, and you know, well, look at the state of his world. What god would be <laughs> overseeing this world? And this is our. It, this is a world which we're living in the Kali Yuga. And the, it's also known as the Iron Age. And Set is associated with iron. And in his age, in the Iron Age, this is an age of strife and of chaos and of all the things that are associated with the Iron Age. So this would stand to reason that this world and this place would be a place of Set. Hmm. I do know that uh, recently we had a guest on the show who was talking about um, the way the Bible was being interpreted, and he came up with the plan that the Bible was actually talking about there being several gods, and God was a god among the gods, and uh, they had this this he had this whole hierarchy he had mapped out of all the different gods, and and how. Uh, a lot of the, the the teachings of the Bible have been altered over the years, but in the original uh, texts, it was talking about he would go before his his uh, council of gods and talk to them, and uh, so there were many gods there, and that would fall into what you're talking about now, because you know we've been taught that there are no other gods. There's one god. That's it. And if you talk about any other gods, then you're a jerk and you're a pagan and all this. But in the, in what you're saying, it kind of goes along with what he was saying, which is there's a whole council of gods, and and a lot of them talked. Yeah, that's true. There are a lot of gods. And actually, though, uh, Set is known as the, the god of gods and the greatest of strengths. And, the, and he is known as the god which all gods must, which you, the god you must go through to get all gods to function, in other words. So, in other words, all of the prayers in ancient texts to get all of the gods to do anything, any of their functions, you had to first do a prayer to set. So, in essence, he was like, <laughs> you could almost compare it to the godfather. You could get all of, if you if you had a, you know, a, 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 some particular thing you needed a particular god to do, you could petition that god to do it. But if you really wanted them to do it really well, You'd petition Set first, hmm. because he's like the Godfather. <laughs> yeah, you'd have to go in and get an audience with Don Corleone before you could talk to anyone else. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, <laughs> so if you really wanted to get on the good side of um, getting the gods to to really do what you want them to do, um, you'd go to the big guy first and have him you know, really enforce the petition. <laughs> wow, there you go. Kind of get behind your idea there. I got right. you. Well, you know, <laughs> Zena, we're, we're winding down a little bit. I know uh, there's probably a lot of people out there that have a lot of questions now, and uh, and this is such a, a deep and, and and involving subject that we're just scratching the surface. How could people kind of learn more about this on their own? Oh, well, first of all, book 12, you could read Set God of Confusion, by Tavelde. if you I'm sure if you just Google Set God of Confusion, you'd find that there's a copy that you could probably download or see online. That would give you at least the first academic understanding of Set's attributes, what kind of God he really is. But aside from that, I do have an outreach program that's the Phoenix program, and that's for short-term people who are actually in need of 
just short uh, range, like a help with things of a spiritual nature, better things are getting through. This is part of our community outreach program. Um, and this is like in terms of things like um, people who have had problems in life that they need help getting through. Right. So, it's not a life path so much as a, as it is something to help you when you need it. Right. Because part of part of what we do in the SLM also is people that work with us, they have to do some sort of community service or something that is part of their um, trade for their teachings. Look up the address on my website and write to the postal address because we're only accessible through postal mail, or the, the ma- mail address, I should say. And that's uh, Zena, Z-E-E-N-A dot E-U is that right. website, yeah. Now, I, I was going to say, I like your idea, the the whole writing a letter thing I like. Personally, I would rather have a, uh, a more direct uh, spiritual connection with the person. So I, I really like yeah. the fact that you're doing this more you know, in the real world as opposed to the virtual one. Yeah, and you'd be surprised. I'll meet you face-to-face if you've got the courage to do it. <laughs> there you go. So that's the irony. Gotcha. Well, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule and for granting us this interview. I know that uh, you don't do a lot of them, and uh, and I'm very thankful for it. Uh, one of the things about Nightwatch I've always been very proud of is, you know, we have guests from all walks of life, from all religions, and uh, we all meet here in a neutral way, and we share ideas and philosophies and ideologies and 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 belief systems in a way that is open and. Uh, and in a way that everyone can learn from each other. And that's something that, you know, you're continuing that with us tonight, and I really want to thank you for that. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate it. And I'd like to end the show maybe with just a little dedication to all your listeners that whatever benefit they may have come away from by listening to any of all this or any new understanding or positive forces that arose during the talk, that may it grow deeper and deeper and hasten their way to liberation and enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. Wow, that's awesome. Thank you very much once again, and and I'd love to talk to you again when you have something going on. Uh, We'd love to bring you back on. It was really, really enlightening. I know Chris would really enjoy it. He just couldn't be here, but I know he would really, really enjoy it. Well, thank you, and I thank Set for bringing me to you. (laughs) There you go. There you go. Have an awesome evening. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.